You are listening to the Get Global Podcast, a weekly journey into the international business landscape with leaders, knowers, and doers from around the world who share their stories and insights on the issues that matter most. Get Global brings you the best to help you thrive in foreign markets. to speak into the microphone for recording purposes. This is not <laughs> amplification. Um, and I'm very nervous to be speaking to this group tonight for actually uh, two reasons. One is there are a lot of people who know a lot more about China than I do. Uh, there's no such thing as a China expert. That's an oxymoron, actually, because things are changing so quickly. And also, I'm not a real businessman. I've always considered myself on the fringes of business legitimacy. Um, that's advertising. And in fact, you can't even say advertising anymore. It's so out of fashion. So now I have to say what I do is I engineer media neutral, idea centric participation platforms. <laughs> Transforming active, uh, uh, passive exposure to active participation to deepen engagement throughout the life cycle of a customer <laughs> relationship. Um, but uh, in advertising, Guanggao, you know, we have something called consumer insight. Xiaofeiji Dongcha, Dongcha. Who here can tell me what the first character of Dongcha means? Dong. Hole. It's a hole, right? It, it, okay, the meaning is deep. And what do you, and what and what do you do with a hole? You wadre. You you unearth it. You dig it out. And so the the foundation actually of advertising is insight. And and we believe that the best insights that explain behavior and that brands and businesses and business models can use resolve tension in the heart. So in these few brief moments where I will chat, I'm going to be talking about two things. One is, is there or is there not a master insight that explains a lot of what is happening in China, both past, present, and future? And then secondly, if that insight is true, what are the golden rules, if you will, of marketing or building businesses in China? So I'm going to offer an a priori apology because I'm going to be making sweeping generalizations. <laughs> and I've been given like seven or eight minutes to talk, so please put your handguns in your pocket uh, and um, we can have a debate you know, during a question and answer session. But um, I was a very typical American when I was going to uh, China. I first got there in 1994. Um, I was 14 years old. No, I, I wasn't. I was born in 1978. I'm almost a millennial. That's not true. Um, but I was a very typical American. Uh, I was a believer in Reagan's shining city on a hill. Actually, that was uh, the first governor of Massachusetts, Winthrop. But I believe that people ultimately wanted to become like us. People ultimately, on their journey to the top of the mountain, they wanted to have our Jeffersonian ideals born of the Enlightenment. And what I realized very quickly is, is that China is becoming modern, it's becoming international, it's becoming globally connected, but it is not becoming Western. There are certain elements that are becoming Westernized, but the culture itself is fundamentally not Western. China is a Confucian culture, Confucian culture, Ru Jia Shou And if we don't understand the basics of what Confucian culture is, then everything is very random. But once you start understanding what Confucian culture is and the tensions of it, then it becomes a little bit easier to decipher. And Confucianism actually has two opposing impulses, I would say. The first one is rooted in what's called the Wu Luan, the five key relationships that make up of all ordered society. Father to son, older brother to younger brother, friend to friend, ruler to rule, um, uh, friend, uh, I'm forgetting one, a husband to wife. But without whipping up a mathematical lather, suffice it to say that in China, things are very rule bound. Things are regimented. There's hierarchy. There's restrictions. You don't rebel. When you do rebel, it's a ticket, a one-way ticket to the land of the outcasts. But the other part of Confucianism is much more dynamic than most Westerners imagine it to be. It's 
ambitious. Confucian society was the world's first socially mobile society. You could climb up the ladder of success. You could dream of grabbing that brass ring and announcing to eternity, to your ancestors, to your progeny, that I have made a significant contribution to society. But how do you get there? It's not by Western individualism. Individualism in a Western sense is when the individual defines himself independent of society. In China, you master convention. You reinterpret convention. You don't break the rules, but you remodel them a little bit. You know? So the master tension of Chinese society, in my observation, is the tension between, on one hand, projection of status, which is big and bold and a mark of your future ambition. Like, for example, all of the apartment buildings in China have very projective names. Um, when I was 31 years old and I did not have a lot of money, I moved to Hong Kong, which, yes, Igo Liangzhi, Wu Xinian Bu Pian, is still part of China. I lived in a place called Tycoon Court, right? <laughs> I was not a tycoon, and there was no courtyard in that building except where you took out the trash, all right? Or in China, the most expensive building in Puxi is called simply Rich Gate. <laughs> or my favorite one in Pudong, which is the, the other side of the, the, the Huangpu River, is the gathering of all heroes under heaven. That's projection of status, right? That's big, that's bold, that's forward thrusting, that's wanting to move up and be successful in life. But then there's another dimension of Confucianism because Confucianism doesn't rely on individual. So institutions have not been developed to protect individual economic and social interests. That's self-protection. That's the baby powder scandal. That's the melamine scandal. That's where you actually have to make sure that you are safe. You know, and that is why Chinese people believe in um, fortune telling, um, palm reading, feng shui. These are all ways of fear of losing face, not speaking up in a hierarchical environment. These are all ways of managing your fate, managing your destiny. And so this tension between, on one hand, projection of status, which is big and bold, on one hand, but on the other hand, protection of economic and social interests, this is something that marketers, if they're really smart, can help consumers do. And this is how marketers, by resolving this tension, can create loyalty. And by loyalty, I mean a price premium. And by price premium, I mean profit margins that are sustainable. And without sustainable profit margins for a foreign business in China, you're gonna get, you're gonna lose because you'll never compete with local companies on an operational agility level. So this projection versus protection results in what I would call, and I apologize for this, I'm, I'm feeling embarrassed. I've never done this out into the void. I usually have you know pictures behind me at least to give me a sense of security. But the <laughs> Three golden rules of marketing in China, all right? I hope the phones are on recording these golden rules. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But the first golden rule, and this is what I call the granddaddy of golden rules, is to maximize public consumption. People will spend much higher price premium on goods that are consumed in public than they will with goods that are consumed inside the home. This is why Chinese people with 20% of disposable income versus Americans buy 50% of the world's luxury goods, according to HSBC. Because luxury in China is not just something to be enjoyed. Luxury is a tool on the battlefield of life. Luxury announces what you are going to become in a public context, but it also explains why certain businesses succeed and others fail. Starbucks, for example. Starbucks created what I call the Houdini Act of Marketing. Houdini being a magician from the early 20th century who escaped from inescapable situations by selling coffee in a land of tea drinkers. There are 3,000 Starbucks stores now in all city tiers of China, and the Chinese don't particularly like coffee, right? How did they do this? They abandoned Howard Schultz's model 
of the third space, that site of private indulgence between home and uh, office. Instead, they turned, through the business model, Starbucks into a gathering site of professional elites. The stores were defined, designed bigger. The tables are bigger, fewer individual plush chairs. The real estate strategy was different. The pricing, because it was all in grade A office buildings at the beginning. The pricing strategy was different. If you go to a Starbucks in China, you pay more, much more for a cup of coffee, about 35% more than you do in America, because it's got the cup emblazoned with the Stargo logo, which is a badge. Their social media strategy is different, but the food is cheap. Food is about 50% of what you'd pay in America because it's all designed for public consumption. And so that is golden rule number one. And this is why IKEA did not succeed until it adjusted its price value equation, you know, uh, to be, before it had the highest footfall in Shanghai of any store in the world and the lowest sales per customer of any sale in the world because people would go get design inspiration and buy it very cheaply at the shop. Uh, down, down, down at the corner. Until they adjusted their price value equation to make it excessively aspirational for in-home consumption, uh, IKEA didn't take off. And now it's penetrated across all second tier cities and starting to go into third tier cities. So that's golden rule number one. Is that relatively clear? Okay. Scale of one to 10, it's okay. Oh, I'm so relieved, right? Now we're gonna get into something a little bit more abstract. And that's what I call, and this is marketing buzzwords, and I apologize. Well, Fei Chong Bao Qian, okay? Yo me o Shanghai ren. Chili. No Shanghainese people here? Ah, yo yi dao zhang hu. But this is what I call externalization of benefit. And by that I mean, whatever thing your product does, it needs to be a means to an end, all right? Uh, it needs to move you forward in life. Two very simple examples for this, okay? One, diamonds. Diamonds in China use the exact same Guangaoyu tagline as they do in America. A diamond is forever. Now, let, actually, let me ask you a question. When you think of a diamond is forever, what do you think that means? What, what are they trying to say? Usually about engagement. Yeah, yeah. It's a symbol of, of what relation. what part of that relation what part of that love love what kind of love intimate love, intimate love true love, love romantic love passionate love what a diamond is forever means in china i mean in america is that this passion will evolve over a lifetime but that flame will still be burning light all right in china when you show them an american De Beers ad, people laugh. <laughs> because when the diamond hits the, the skin, there's a climax, you know, it gets a little bit embarrassing, all right? But when we say a diamond is forever in China, we mean chengnu, commitment that lasts a lifetime. Because a marriage is not between two people in China. A marriage, yes it is of course, but it's between two families as well that come together to protect itself against the vicissitudes of life. So a diamond is forever is actually a very practical thing. It's a way that a man, oh poor Chinese men, they have a burden on their shoulders. They have to demonstrate their ability to provide for the family and this is a marker on that ability. And that is why diamonds have achieved a 90% penetration rate in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, first year cities, a 70% penetration rate for households that are making over 10,000 renminbi in second tier cities. It's become a cultural imperative because we've brought it into alignment with a different worldview. Nike is another example. Nike in America, what does just do it mean? I'm gonna ask another question. Just do it, what's just do it mean? Nike. Nike. Just, well, it's a little bit more than that, all right? It's a little more than just do it, all right? It's bucking up against convention. It's a rebellious statement. It's saying, no matter what they say, very individualistic, all right? You just do what you want to do, all right? 
So if you're a little girl, you can beat the big boys on the basketball court. If you're an uh, amputee, you can win a marathon race. So it's quite individualistic. But in Chinese, when we say just do it, we always add yong, ying dong, use sports. Use sports to get what you want, right? So even a brand like Nike has to have the same spirit, but it needs to be brought into alignment with a very means to an end attitude. So that's the second rule is everything has to be means to an end. It goes down to the details. When you go to a spa, you don't just go to relax. You go to recharge your batteries a little bit. You know, when you have a skin cream, you don't just have soft skin. You have skin so soft he loves to touch it. So it reinforces the bonds of a relationship. Everything is a means to an end. So that's the second golden rule. Is that clear? All right. The third, the third golden rule is reassurance, but I call it reassurance 2.0. As I said, China is not an individualistic society. People do not have faith in institutions to protect their economic and individual interests. So the first and most important thing that a brand needs to do is to reassure that it's going to be good quality, right? That's basic, all right? So cars need to spend a lot of time talking about reassurance, particularly for new car buyers. But reassurance can be very modern. You know, one thing that people probably don't realize is, is that China's exploding e-commerce scene, and by the way, now 26% of all retail in China takes place on e-commerce, where I think the equivalent figure in America is about 16%, right? Didn't happen until the business model was reassuring, right? They reassured in two basic ways. The first one is you don't buy directly from a brand. You buy directly from a mall. You have Alibaba that has Alibaba.com with lots of stores inside of it. You have Tmall. You have Taobao. Tmall is B to C. Taobao is uh, C to C. But the fact is, is these are huge entities. Scale in China reassures. Higher appliances has broad scale. It reassures. China Mobile has broad scale. It reassures, right? And so that reassurance based on scale is one reason people are willing to buy online because they're not going to get a counterfeit because it's uh, done by a big company and it's supported by the, the central government. The second way that e-commerce has reassured is through virtual payment guarantees. The ubiquity of Alipay, the scale of Alipay, the fact that everything is in escrow, the fact that you have instant receipts, it's all been designed to reassure that the virtual transaction is safe. So that's about reassurance. And so even the most modern reassurance can be quite fun and quite cool. Like has everybody heard of something called Singles Day? Can somebody tell me what Singles Day is? It's like the it's like the Black Friday of here. Like but it's huge, triple, black. quadruple yeah, yeah, black. I mean, exactly. it, it makes it Black Friday look like a local store yeah. is having a sale. Yes, but it started off. I'm going to bring this back to reassurance. All right, in a second. It started off being a holiday that took place on November 11th. One 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 Singles Day, and it was basically a holiday for the. It was retail therapy for the lovelorn. If you didn't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you would buy something for yourself on Singles Day. It has since morphed into a national display of economic power. China's making a transition between manufacturing and export to consumer driven, and this is a way with central government support that you can. Kill two birds with one stone. One, have a party and make it fun, make it shopping, right? But also have a demonstration of China's aggregate consumer spending power and make that declaration to the nation and to the world. So this reassurance, right, can have many different levels. It can even go up to the level of national pride, national security, the safety of the current growth model. All right. So marketers, in conclusion, if you are able to resolve this tension between projection and protection through these rules, if I will, or guidelines of maximization of public consumption, 
products as a means to an end or externalization of benefit, or third, reassurance on emotional and social levels and even national levels, you will be beloved and your brands will be relevant in the lives of consumer. And through that relevance, you will have loyalty. And through loyalty, you will have margin and a healthy business. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Tom. Um, so I was originally gonna just chat with him, but We've got a lot of really interesting people here. Oh, please ask questions before, all right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so we've gone through a lot of social change and political change, even economic change in the last year, right? You have the 19th Party Congress. You had the recent uh, development where Xi Jinping's uh, term limits have dis disappeared. Um, what do you think is going on socially? What do you think is going on beneath the surface? What do you think is going to be the reaction to this socially? Or will there be a reaction? Will people keep just living their lives? Has this done something to the Chinese psyche? Um, I'm, I have not done my focus groups yet, but uh, I actually I have. I've, I've asked several people. The short answer is people are fine with it. Um, there are a few people that aren't, but most there's only one truth to Chinese morality, all right? Regardless of whether you take a look at Taoism, Confucianism, legalism, Moism, that the only absolute bad thing is chaos. Chaos is something that is bringing people backward. Stability is a platform on which progress is constructed. And so Chinese are very sensitive to any hints of instability. I believe that most people think that Xi Jinping, or Xi Da Da, as he's called, all right, is a, perceived as a leader who is powerful, strong, and stable. So I do think that most people, while they say in the future, this could be a problem, we've seen this happen before, for now, they're okay. I have not met anybody that's up in arms about it. Of course, you'll get something on the internet, but I think that most of the reaction is going to be, you know what, as long as it's working, it'll be okay. What happens 10 years from now, I can't say. So in our podcast, you also talked about um, the difference between how people behave IRL in real life, uh, the lives that people live uh, with their friends and relatives, their co-workers, uh, their community and how they behave online. You have all kinds of interesting, cool memes coming out of China, um, really fantastic stuff where it doesn't look at all like normal life in China. Um, what is at the bottom of that? And why do you feel that this is important for Chinese uh, youth in particular, but more broadly, the population? What does the digital element to uh, China's experience, uh, what does that do for them? What, is, what, what does this enable for them? That's a big question, but China believes that a generation lasts five years, all right? So now you have the Zhou Lingho, the post-90s, and you have the Zhou Wu Ho, the post-95s, and now the Ling Ling Ho, the post-zeros. And if I were to make a generalization about them versus the people in the post-80s, the people in the post-90s, they grew up in a period of affluence, relatively speaking. Everything I'm saying is relative as opposed to absolute. But the future is a little bit anxious, you know, because th things are slowing down a little bit. I would suggest that the Chinese 90s are living in the now much more, right? And they're much more into experiences. The one-dimensional, unidimensional definition of success, which was professional, has morphed into a de definition of success, which is much more multidimensional. So the post 90s, what they want to do is they want to make their mark by pursuing their passion. But they still exist in a society that is relatively un un 
evolved from a traditional standpoint. It's still a highly regimented society. So what people want to do online is liberate themselves. So brands need to be platforms of self-expression, emotional release, and also where you can generate social currency. So there's a lot of identity experimentation that goes on on brands. Like for example, there's this one guy, Lee Hongjie, who is on Aloha.com, which is basically a gay version, all right, of um, Instagram. All right. And what he's doing on there is he's got different identities of himself, you know, one man, one woman, one something in between, one nun, you know, and then he sings a song that starts off with the words, what about my bag? I mean, which is very traditional, my, my, my bag. Chinese put up a lot of faith in bag. And then it turns into phonetically sounding just like, what about us? Which is almost a social statement, all right? It's almost a, a, a statement of rebellion. So identity experimentation is happening online a lot, you know, but it's safe from a distance. It's between avatars. We work a lot with Samsung, we work a lot with Huawei, and no matter what, when you take a selfie, the biggest sin that you can do is send it out before it's been beautified, all right? So. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, you don't need it at all. Are you kidding? No, 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 the, right, the, uh, the no. company, Me Too. Oh, Me Too, Me, Me, Tuan. Me, Me Too. Me Too. May too, yeah. May too, yeah. So the beautif beautification apps are really big. And so that's the base. And then moments that matter come next, all right? So the, the key thing is it helps you self-express, but you need to self-express from a difference and you need to express your passions from a distance so that people don't risk losing face. So if you are um, a brand in the United States and you uh, cater to niche audiences, uh, elements of lifestyle, you're really going after an image rather than a, a particular use, right? This is not necessarily a practical product, it's an awesome product. Something that uh, people get excited about for reasons other than just getting the job done. Do you reach them online? Do you reach them in real life? Some combination? Where would you split your budget if you're really gonna wanna nail this? 50-50. Um, if you, you need to have an offline budget because offline does two things. One, it defines a brand proposition through what we used to call traditional media. Uh, you, or let's put it this way, filmic expressions. You're not allowed to tell, say, television commercial anymore. They're media neutral filmic expressions. You know? All right. But um, also the experience has to happen. So take, for example, Xiaomi. All right. Xiaomi, the mobile phone and now lifestyle uh, ecosystem, as they call themselves. They started off completely online, but recently, of course, they've realized that unless you have an offline experience center, you know, where people can actually interact with the brand, things evaporate very quickly, all right? So you're going to have to make sure that things are both online and offline. One thing I will say about online, though, it's different in China than it is in the rest of the world in the sense of the role of online opinion leaders. It's even stronger, and the ability to have communities, you know, you know, through WeChat is also, we all know about WeChat, I, I imagine, you know, um, it's very important. So online communities, so you can find people that are like-minded are even more fundamental to identity expression in China than they are in the United States. Because overall, Chinese have an emotional relationship with their online identities more than the Western people who have a tend to have a functional relationship, relatively speaking. So just today, we had uh, some interesting news about trade wars getting ratcheted up. My expertise, of course. Yeah. But what's important to this, I think, also is uh, to understand Brand America in light of all these phenomena, right? Uh, here, there is an element of frustration with China. It's around jobs. It's around all these other things other than what uh, you know Chinese companies may be wanting to do here. Those things seem to be separated in some way. Um, in China, how how is Brand America affected by these phenomena in the political sphere? Is there much that we need to be thinking about, especially if it starts to get nasty? Um, first of all, whenever you, I'm sorry for offending anybody's political sensitivities, but the first reaction when you say Trump to Lampu is people just laugh. All right, at the beginning they just laughed and called him not a serious politician. Now, I think that Trump is representing bully xing, not rational. All right. And that becomes, again, a fear of instability. 
So I do think that if a trade war does erupt, that will be very, very bad for brand America. And the, the sorry fact is, is that Chinese really do like Americans, you know. So what's happened recently is a corruption of the American brand. So we've got the food ready, but I wanted to take some quick questions because we've got a lot of experience here. Uh, <laughs> folks who have some really valuable perceptions of China and what what they uh, in their in their part of the, the business landscape. So um, first, before we jump in, I want to get a show of hands about someone who's got like an itching question. Like, is there anybody here who either wants to debate him in the parking lot <laughs> or fight me? Yeah. Or uh, someone who's just got a question or some view that they want to throw into this mix and get a debate started. Show of hands. Okay. Two. Anyone down here? Maybe you guys couldn't hear him. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Uh, Don't make me lose face. Tell me. What's on your mind? So, um, I spent about two months there over the last six, and I... So I've done a, a, I've taken a lot of meetings, and there seems there's like this like weird culture thing where it's like you know you take the meeting and it's great, and then you go out to a lavish dinner and it's great, and then like you never hear from them, right? Like it's like a, this sort of like. So I'm curious about <clears throat> if you have experience with like what generally gets the deal over the hump, so to speak, um, and also um, you know how do you find like what's the best way to find the this is a I this is a tough question to answer I know but like what's the best way to find the partner that's going to walk the walk as opposed to talk and there's a lot of talk in business in China. Everybody's gonna make you a billionaire. But then like when it comes to sort of like the next step they yeah. suddenly disappear. Well so the question is how do we avoid business meetings that go go nowhere? How do we close the deal? And is there any type of way of identifying partnership uh, that is going to be pragmatic? All right. And I think you answered your own question in two words that you said. Next step. When you establish partnerships in China and when or when you want to have a, a, a deal closed, they're looking for two things. All right. They're looking for the vision that you have at the top of the mountain, right? And they're also looking for an incremental step-by-step -step way of getting there. The Chinese abhor breakthrough, right? So what you need to say is, yes, this is ambitious, but here's step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six, and we're gonna be with you every bit of the way. And if you are, by the way, not negotiating directly at the table, all right, uh, with them, you know, that is a factor of lost trust. So there's the whole other element of needing to open yourself up to be a trustworthy negotiator. And this is why, by the way, contracts in China, it's a myth, myth, myth that Chinese don't like contracts. They love contracts, all right? They, they, you will go back and forth on the details of contracts. But to answer your question, define the vision, define the route of getting there very quickly, I mean, step by step rather, yibu yiga jiao ying, one step at a time, and then make sure that you have a contract that reflects that in the details, and then it will work better. I kind of want some conflict. Does anyone disagree with Tom on any of this? Whoa, all right, please do tell. Yeah, I think, I think uh, identify the key person, find the, find the leader on the table. Of course. The, find out who is actually doing the job. Once you identify those two people, talk to them, then you finish. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just identify the key leader and who is actually doing the job. So make sure that you're doing the, who's gonna execute and who's gonna actually make the decision. I will still push back just a little bit to say that even the key leader is gonna wanna see step by step, but I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. I think identification of key leader is Go on. And make sure that you drink, dine, and sing karaoke with them. Wait, so what is the role of karaoke? What is, why is that important? What does that do? I think so. Both of us were born in China. Wait, I, we, I have to repeat for the microphone. You're saying, oh, you did say it. Never mind. Yeah, sorry. So I think relationship in, this is a huge generalization. Relationship in America is clear, identified, regulated, and transactional. Relationship in China is wonk and social, 
need to spend time getting to know them, know their wife, know their kids, know their dog. And then it's they, so Regan says, trust and then verify. In China, you distrust and then you verify. Right. And, and that's why I said, tr- I, I, agree, I agree with you 100%. Trust facilitation is everything. And if we're going to go into karaoke, I've got a theory, all right? Uh, my theory on karaoke is, is that it is a way of, and it's the same for beer, all right? You know, you know, there are two types of friends, right? There's friends of the heart, and then you have Joe Ro Pung Yo, all right? Friends of wine and meat, all right? These are, these are friendships that are not deeply rooted. And what karaoke does is it brings Joe Ro Pung Yo together, and you're able to let the barriers come down, all right? You're letting your true emotions come out through the song, but you're doing it in a structured way. It's not like you're throwing jello at the wall, all right? So it's freedom in a framework and that makes people feel safe and that's good for trust facilitation. And it's the same reason why people eat at round tables, not long tables, because it makes the interaction much more predictable, but also natural, all right? So trust facilitation is so important. So you're saying also that there's a lot that you can learn when someone's belting out Britney Spears in the middle of the night, right? What kind of person this is? Can you? Is this someone who is uh, transparent? Um, yeah, there's every culture seems to have this in some form or another. Mexico, it's the two tequila lunch. Uh, India's got multiple versions of this. Um, sir, I had a question, a little bit relevant to what he was talking about earlier. I come to a lot of these dinners. <clears throat> My biggest question when I leave here: we're all here for the same reason, right? And I would love if you guys, I don't know if you're planning on doing this, but the following day to send out an email to everyone with maybe one or two questions to send a one sentence on what you do, because there's so much synergy amongst the room. I only spoke to two people and there's synergy there that we may be doing business together. So I feel like there's a lot of opportunity, like we're all here for that, but you know, and this is a perfect example, you get to talk to this one of my best friends, that's somebody I just met, but we don't talk to anybody else and it's like two, three hour, is there anything like that that may go out? Like maybe one, your, your name, your company name, and then just a short description on what you do, and then you don't have to respond. We can decide, you know what I mean, to reach out to you or you or you if there is synergy there, right? Uh, I would love to see that. Se- being sensitive to the privacy rules of uh, our era, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to chat around and kind of get the vote from folks um, when this tones down a little bit. But I think it's a good idea to get people. Maybe and not if you don't want to be part of it, you don't have to. But I, I can't imagine the like nobody here. We're all in business. You know what I mean? There's no knucklehead sitting here at dinner. Like sure, sure. If you don't want me to reach out to you, that's it. There's just nothing there, and maybe they don't have to fill it out. Let me think on this. I think it's a good idea. Uh, in principle, I, I'll, I'll think a little bit more carefully on that. Um, anybody have any uh, questions directly related to China? Viv, you're at it. Talk, being the brand marketer that you are with these insights, which I love, and I, I feel what you're writing lately about how it's consistent because it really has an impact on everything that we're doing. And a lot of the old paradigms are shifting, I think, by the week right now. Uh, China strategy. I mean, I heard today on NPR that farmers in the Midwest suddenly are no longer spending money on their their crops because of what happens with with this dialogue. And we don't know what's really going to happen to this territory. But, but, um, you know, I I spoke to uh, David. Is it David Blake? Uh, he's the Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the big question is are are the how quickly evolving are the young Chinese? All right. And if you uh, go to any focus groups on one level, they're evolving very quickly. All right. Like I said before, they want experience. They want to make a contribution right now. 
you know, they, health and wellness is what people are talking about more and more and more, all right? So it, they use a lot of the same words that even millennials would use here in America. But if you go one level deeper, it still is something that requires societal acknowledgement, all right? It's still something that people want to generate other people's uh, admiration for. So like when you talk about wellness, for example, all right? Well, number one, gyms are still very, very niche, all right? And the definition of wellness is much broader, as you know. But people talk about a glow that other people can see that emanates from you, all right? So you still want to have something, even for this new generation, be acknowledged. And I think that that's the power of social media is that it enables you to share and be acknowledged. But yes, things are evolving, but they're not, again, becoming Western individualists. So even in first-tier cities? Even in first-tier cities. So gym where they, they belong to they can have, Yeah. Like, oh, we, we work at WeWork. That's where, we're, that's where we are. So it, the, the banner there is... Uh, Creatives welcome here, all right? You know, um, yes, people definitely have more of a desire to do something uh, that is their own. They don't necessarily need to be part of the system. The internet is opening up lots of new avenues of creating your own business, but there's still no Steve Jobs on the horizon, right? There's still no mold-breaking innovation on the horizon. Everything again is incremental and everything, even subcultural tribes, all right? Like if you start talking about America, what happened with uh, punk or hip hop, you know, from uh, a punk from, from England, it became mainstream. Subculture tribes, they're there, all right, you know, uh, but they don't penetrate the mainstream and that's the difference. So ultimately mainstream is still safe, on, on, I believe. But this is a, this is a question of deep debate and people could take me out and beat me up in the parking lot. Yeah. So we have food on the way, and I'm sure discussions uh, that we're all going to want to get back to in light of all of this, uh, these new ideas. Uh, maybe there are things that you've been chewing on or something like that. But I, I would like to get back to an idea that I've been chewing on, which is uh, at the beginning where you were saying that going out into the world thinking that that they wanted to be like us. Every single country that I've, I've gone and developed an expert network in, particularly India, this is the first thing that they warn us against, right? Uh, in India, you know, you, it can be very deceptive because you'll be talking to people with no accent whatsoever. Uh, they went to school in England. They went to school in the United States. They look, talk, feel, behave uh, Western in every single way except what happens when you get to know them in their family circumstance or the way that they behave online or the way that they feel when they feel like their country is being snubbed by someone else. Um, you know, if there's one thing that I hope that Get Global can um, take to the world, it, if, I, if this gets on my, my gravestone, I'm going to be a happy man. It's learn to see everybody according to them, their own nature. Um, so. I hope you'll all uh, come and join us in future dinners like this. Um, uh, for those of you who are coming to the, uh, this is your first encounter with Get Global. Uh, we help companies uh, thrive in foreign markets. This is all about how to succeed in foreign markets, how to understand foreign markets, whether you're in uh, you know, B2B, B2C, B2G. Uh, we have plenty of programming for the aerospace and defense crowd too. Um, but we love understanding how countries behave and what they're like from the inside out uh, because that is, um, I think, an unnatural perspective uh, from across all these you know, long oceans. So um, thank you for being here. I hope you'll enjoy dinner and may all of your conversations be wonderful and insightful and convivial. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to find out more about our events and get more global intel every week, sign up for our newsletter at getglobal.co.